Okay, so thank you for coming today to the third installment of the Artist Talk series. Today we'll be talking about memory practices and archiving. And Wanky and I are students here, and we have Dr. Linda Lai or Linda with us today. Linda with us. Linda. <laughs> um, she has been our supervisor for two years. And do you, do you want a brief introduction? Or? No. no? Okay. <laughs> These are very good students. <laughs> okay, thank you. So, yes. So, okay. These are our names, and Linda. <laughs> so first I'll talk a bit about my project. It is called Cavity, and it is a mixed media installation. And people on Zoom, you can see an image of the installation, and you can, this is my work. Um, so I'm, the point of departure is Kowloon Mall City. It used to be a Chinese enclave during the British rule. It was an ungoverned and lawless place. It was one of the most densely populated places on earth, but it was demolished in early 1990s. It was go it's gone now, so it's not there anymore. And it has since become a park. There's no sign of it left. So I'm interested in the concept of absence spaces where the past still exists, but not anymore. Um, what I noticed and what I'm interested in is the perimeter. Only the perimeter remains, um, not even the physical walls bordering the city, but the position of the perimeter. There's a park in its place and containing within these, this perimeter is absence itself. So in my project, I'm trying to look for physical traces of the city and the objects I, I obtained, you can see, people here can see that I collected some physical objects. Um, and these objects are presences to the city's absence. So the main narrative of my um, work is I take on the role of an archeologist traveling from a far away place to the park in search of the lost city. And most of my video is filmed at the park itself. So I will talk briefly about what I've, what I've learned, what I've gathered in my um, work. So the perimeter, with the idea of the perimeter, when you make it small, like this square, it encloses a space. And in ecology and archaeology, they use quadrats, which is also a square. Um, it is used to collect samples and conduct experiments. So once you throw this quadrat, it will randomly select a space and then you can collect samples from it. Grids are also often used to locate and quantify historical finds. So as you can see in this image, um, these are some people gridding an archaeological site. So it will make it easier for them to locate and quantify where they found the artifacts. Another grid that I found is this checkerboard. And this is Checkerboard Hill, Gatsai San. And it is located in Kowloon City. So Kai Tak Airport was right next to Kowloon Wall City. And when pilots flew the planes into Kai Tak Airport, first they will see this checkerboard and then they'll turn left and then they will land. So the checkerboard hill is still there and it no longer serves a purpose, um, but then because the, the airport is no longer there as well. So it's just this sign. And so I made it, it, look, it reminds me of the, the gridding of the archeological site. Um, and then I'm interested in maps and I've collected these two maps. Um, maps are um, kind of like a um, 2D or just a representation of a space. So on that one, the hand-drawn one is made by Thomas and he's an old man and he lived there for 20, he lived at Kalumwal City for 20 years. And he drew this map from memory. And the first thing he drew was the perimeter bordering the space. And then as you can see, he, it's very jumbled up and the words that he writes would signify what is important to him or what he remembers. 
Um, and then the rows are represented by straight lines. And his house actually leads to a well, which you can see in this image of the map of Kowloon Wall City Park. And you can see that the well is still there. Um, I don't know if I can point it out on Zoom here. The well is still there. Mm -hmm. And all these street names are still the same street names in Kowloon Wall City. So Dai Zengai, people would use to um, walk along this street to the well to collect water. So nothing of the city is actually left, but just the names of the streets and the position of the streets, which I found was quite interesting. And then I chose, well, this is kind of a central subject in my film, it's teeth and dentures. So there are a lot of dentists at Kowloon Wall City. And you would find that kind of interesting because um, in an ungoverned place, there used to be a lot of triad members, a lot of crime, drug problems, prostitution, but you wouldn't think that dentists <laughs> would be very, um, a, a very frequently seen thing in the Kowloon Wall City. So I'm interested in teeth for many reasons. Teeth is characteristic of each person, and it will remain even longer than our bones. It's not true. <laughs> it's not true. I, I can now prove it's not really? true. Right. <laughs> it survives longer than the bones. Oh, oh true. <laughs> I mean, the teeth that stay, I guess. <laughs> um, and it is also an artifact into human history. Um, and that um, the dentists that practiced at Kalimwal City, a common procedure that they would do is to make dentures, fake teeth. So I actually found a dentist that worked there for two years and he made me a set of dentures. So to make dentures, you have to make an imprint of a, um, a patient's mouth. And this image by Greg Gerard is actually from a dentistry at Kalumot City. And these are all the imprints or the molds of people that visited um, displayed on the shop window. So I'm also very interested in indexicality and negative space, which means there's a sign pointing to an object and the, a physical relationship between the sign and the object. So the imprint of someone's mouth is, has a physical relationship between the, the print and the mouth itself. Um, also, I also made a rubbing or a print of one of the only signs of Kowloon Walled City, which is this gray model replica of it. And then I just made a print and the print also has a physical relationship to the model itself. And also interesting, one of the many interesting accidents is that I met the tour guide at Kalimol City Park and he goes there every single day for 20 years. Even if it rains, he goes there and he's just volunteers and tells the story of Kalimol City. But he is also a very famous paper tearing artist and he's been on the BBC <laughs> and the TED Talks, things like that. And he tore my name. And so using tearing holes in a piece of paper and through creating negative space, there's presence. Um, he made and he made my name. So yeah, that's kind of a very brief in a brief look into my project. Mm -hmm. And I will give it to Wanky. Thank you. Uh, so my work is called News from Home, and I think uh, to introduce it, it's, uh, I would like to share a work I did uh, before this, and it's because I think today's topic is about the narrative of uh, artifacts and history. So I'm all, always interested in, like there are always uh, some intimates, uh, I think I find I like to just to post it intimate uh, sen sentiment and with the grand narrative or a bigger context. So it's like this work is showing what Linda always says, is like there is uh, something very official, uh, very linear, but the personal memory, which encounters some uh, social event or, or things uh, could be very uh, personal or 
it's, it's different. And then in this, I borrowed the uh, framework from uh, Chantal Ackman in 1977, in which uh, she should, uh, she, she was from Belgium and then she flew to New York to, uh, for, his, uh, uh, for her artistic journey. And in this film, she mainly uh, took many um, video uh, documenting the cityscape of the New York City and and then it just to post it with uh, her the letters from her mother and so through the whole film is uh, she reading the the text of her mother and for me I sort of uh, took this layer and try to uh, add some more. Uh, I took the space that is like in the virtual space uh, that record uh, the, the Hong Kong street, which is a, a street that we use to uh, express our opinion a lot. And, and now we couldn't really do this anymore. So it, it is sort of like a distance uh, place for me, uh, despite it's at the same time very close to my heart. And then I uh, just will sit with uh, my mom's uh, messenger, which is nowadays uh, the way we communicate. And I will share a bit of the video. So this is a bit of the idea. Uh, 
Yeah, so uh, beside these uh, messages, I also add there is some more text. One is from uh, a British uh, contemporary uh, text. Uh, it's a plate, actually. Uh, it's from the script. There is uh, from at one and the, and the end of the play, uh, which I find it match uh, the context of what we are experiencing. And then also the, in, towards the end, there is a quote from the letters from, the, uh, from a girl in prison, which is uh, the messages I got as well when I was away from Hong Kong. And from this, I also start to uh, explore this kind of uh, fragment from the image because uh, first is a uh, very practical reason like I try to avoid the square that the image always contain within the video and then I also start to think that this um, when you extract something from this image it again open up uh, the possibility of what it could represent and also I find that this uh, uh, this history is always in fragment and it's not it's always not complete and when when there is these gaps and it's, it, it become the temptation then that attract us to explore more so so this is something that I I look from the history at the same time I hope can plant the seed to uh, seduce uh, people in the future that might go back to the past and look where they come from. So this is my part, and then we have a <laughs> collaboration. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so this is our collaborative artwork. It is called Use of Seawater in Public Swimming Pools. And it is actually completely based on this single document. It was published in 1976, and we found this in the Hong Kong Public Library archive. And it is a memo from the to a memo for the members of stand the standard swimming pools and beaches subcommittee. And they're arguing against the use of seawater in public swimming pools. And we took some keywords and some kind of interesting phrases, and we delved into different narratives that this document kind of encapsulates. So this is the document and you guys can look on this one as well if you want to look at it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's... Um... So we, we sort of begin from here and then we try to uh, sort of not just uh, put, make it like a neutral way, but we, we try to explore or we, we sort of create some uh, imagination mm -hmm. narrative and also in the research it's more like um, uh, not a not a straight line that we, 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 we research by association with yes. our experience or something that we encounter yeah. by chance. Yes, so we're trying to reimagine history and the way we um, looked at this Hong Kong's past is through a kind of dreamlike association. <laughs> um, so we actually made several frames or collages based on this document. And this is one of the ones I chose, oh, this is the one I made. It is, I named it a highly contaminated pool. So this is the swimming pool that the, the memo or the document was talking about. And they were arguing against the use of seawater in the swimming pool. Um, this is an image of that swimming pool in the 1970s. And I used, I took some of the words from the document and put it on the image. And they use such negative wording, like it will clog the course of filters. It is highly, sea, the sea is highly contaminated, growing algae and so on. So I use these words to juxtapose a very family friendly um, environment, <laughs> as you can see. And then another one I made is also this. this um, so the alg algal bloom causes red coloration of the sea and the phenomenon is called red tide. Um, and 
The first occurrence of red tides in Hong Kong was recorded in 1975, which is a year before this document. Some algae species may release toxins and is harmful to local ecology. So the algae causes this red color in the sea. And sometimes I still see it today. Um, and then I put this with an image of a, sw the sw a swimming pool in, in Hong Kong in the 1970s as well. And from that, I made this one. Um, so in 1976, the same year of the publication, Miss Universe was held in Hong Kong for the first time at the Lee Theater. And just a year prior was the first ever recorded red tide in the city. There are 83 algae species known to contribute to red tides in Hong Kong. Most cause no harm. And there were 72 entrants to the competition. So this, this image of the entrance to Miss, Miss Universe, I found on a Facebook page group. Um, and they collected the, a magazine. And you have all the information of these, these women, their name, their age, their height, their profession, and also it has their height, weight, and the samway, which is like your, is it your? The, the three big numbers. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and I found that interesting because where I found these microscopic images of the algae, they also have the name, um, the date, that they were discovered, the size. Mm. So it's kind of the data, the databases are quite similar. So yeah. And then oh. when he machine. And then uh, because there's around the same time, I uh, I I I get quite uh, the few keywords is the swimming pool and then the, the date we're looking at is the 1970s. So uh, during that time there is a, a a ceremony of the uh, the green moss called uh, called lap sap chong, and there there is a ceremony of burning this uh, lap sap chong. Uh, the lip <laughs> yeah, as 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 a as a cleaning uh, campaign, and so this this image is actually found in uh, two thousand nineteen. Uh, but I try to create a narrative that is saying. Uh, is a practice of this uh, burning of the Moscow uh, in its uh, 50 year anniversary. And then around the same time about the seawater is uh, we have the, uh, during that time, Hong Kong is having a severe drought. And so that's when we, we are, Hong Kong has the, tri uh, the treaty with the mainland China that we start uh, buying water from uh, the the mainland, and so I just posted this uh, historical photo of uh, the first treaty was signed, and this is a recent photo that uh, there is a renewal mm -hmm. of the treaty uh, at 2020, and also here is actually the the price that we have been paying to the uh, to the mainland for the water. So <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't remember it. <laughs> it's Kindness. And the last is um, an artwork uh, done by Samson Wong and Jason Lam, who is also alumni from SCM. And is there is a Kang Dan machine they did, uh, I forget now, I think it's around 2016 or 17. And it's a Kang Dan machine that is uh, talking, uh, counting from 2047. It's like 50 year uh, since our return to the China. And, and there is also during the research we are saying uh, the their prediction of the rise of sea level because of the uh, global warming. So I uh, added this image to make like the sea, like Hong Kong is sunken. And then this artwork, when it closed to 2047, uh, it is shown again in the uh, ICC tower. And, and the research, because we also touch on the year that is uh, when the Cross Harbor Tunnel was built. So uh, there is actually literature that address this um, moment, this change, this drastic change uh, of the experience of uh, daily durer of Hong Kong. So uh, 
that's why uh, it's, it's also about time. So, so I put this together to see what's the chemistry that it creates. Yep. Yeah. So and this that, is that concludes our presentation. <laughs> <laughs> um, Briefly. Yeah. So if you have question, you can always raise or type in the chat box or in the at the at this time maybe Linda would response to us. <laughs> <laughs> what do you want me to talk about? I mean, I, I, I am familiar with these projects you are discussing. Mm -hmm. So I, I think maybe you can throw a few questions to frame our discussion, but maybe at the same time we can yeah, have the like audience the here and online to throw queries. <laughs> <laughs> um. I guess because our topic is about mm. memory practices and archiving, I was wondering what is the role of the artist or role of art making in um, archiving? Shouldn't this be the, the question the two of you should now take up? <laughs> because you started with um, having this impression yeah. that there is a connection between art making and the trend of archiving is marking out some new spaces or new possibilities for, for artists. And, and then these things put together is often in actual practice. I mean, not philosophically, but in actual practice is always tied to questions of history or the, the lacking of historical accounts mm -hmm. or some uh, concrete lived experiences, right? So I think each of you or in these three projects are ac actually three very different takes you have adopted to answer this question. Mm -hmm. So maybe I actually would like to hear more from you, mm -hmm. but perhaps uh, let's establish a few things so we don't have to debate because we need to have a point the point of departure has to to be established before we take off to discuss to disagree which is what i hope we we would um that for perhaps let's say that first of all uh, when we talk about history we are actually talking about accounts of the past right because uh it seems too too much for us to handle to imagine that there's really something called history. I mean, history for me is about the past, it's about the past, but history when it is being discussed or being used in our, in our daily practices, including art making and social criticism or cultural criticism, it, it is very concrete. It's always about uh, those accounts like the stories or the narratives. I think I would like to use the word accounts that people have made so that we can have access to the past so that we can see and touch upon things that we, we are very remote from. I think that's history, right? Normally it was here, <laughs> you don't call this history, but you call this history because here is an account about something that you don't see and touch anymore. But here, this account is taking us back. So let's establish this. When we talk about history, let's not try to um, throw around those concepts that would confuse us, like uh, history is real or not real. <laughs> Just like when we talk about documentary, this is often very confusing to say, is this truth and what truth? So we are assuming that history cannot be accessed until, unless we, form accounts, mm -hmm. which means any, any accounts of history is already mediated. Mm -hmm. It has to go through a certain, me certain kind of media practices. Either you, you write, so there's a lot of uh, because therefore consequence causes that sort of thing if you write, that you are very much invited to, to look at very loose facts and then you see the the causal relation, you see the because and the therefore in between these fragments. But if you are 
using um, video, for example, in um, both, I think, especially in um, uh, GY's, GY's case, uh, video does not always organize or summarize anything. Instead, it shows more than tell, right? So if it is showing rather than telling, then it is a very more open kind of document that invites us to, to come and, and feel and take a look. There are things that, that we can agree upon. For example, if this is white, then unless I'm blind, <laughs> then we can agree that it's right. right. If the document like says uh, 1976, then it's 1976. We, we do not start to doubt that, or maybe it's not, because <laughs> otherwise we can't talk about anything. But there are things that we, we actually cannot agree upon. And especially human experiences are things we can't boil down to a few words or points of summary, um, even if we are always trying to do that. So a lot of times when we try to pin down on something and conclude on an experience, we lose the details, we lose the facts, we lose the sensations, we lose all these different levels of uh, emotional uh, interaction with the, the so-called past because we, uh, we want to rely on maybe some handy adjectives or verbs or conclusions, right? So that the video, in fact, is doing quite the opposite. It is showing you what is in front of the camera and yet it doesn't tell you much. So how do we learn from uh, GY's uh, video, for example? through your narrative strategy, uh, through how you cut the film, how you arrange the, the order of the sequences, how you just suppose two. So these two screens are supposed to compare or maybe to show that, uh, that there is no single characteristic to any event, uh, that it depends on where you look. So on and on and on, you, you, can, you can say that. But when it comes to archiving, I think it's actually um, more uh, experimental approach to um, keeping the, the past. Because to begin with, archiving is to say that if we don't do anything to keep something, to collect, to preserve, there's no, no history we can talk about, right? So archiving is a very specific act. It's less about interpretation which is how we normally understand the historical account, which is an interpreted account. But archiving emphasis is not on interpretation, it's on collecting. So again, there's something very similar between taking a lot of images and collecting a lot of uh, video clips and archiving, because we you don't actually have a very clear uh, specific uh, objectives. You don't tell yourself, okay, I will pick up anything that would tell us the, the meaning of life. You don't do that. It's more like the great, the great, the great exercise. You just tell yourself, I'll go here. I will try to see if, okay, I'm not here. This is where I look. And let me see what there is. And so archiving normally is organized by a very basic information, like where, when, how, why, what. <laughs> and so that it will be kept very, very open for whoever is coming in to use the archive. So this is the tricky part because um, in the past, the work of archiving is the government's, the state um, job, you know, the museum is the place where the central government wants to uh, make a decision on what to be remembered, what deserves remembering. But now when we are talking here, we are already traveling like uh, over a hundred years away from the from archive as a national archive, uh, which is supposed to be controlled by people who can have a control over what the story is about the country. This 100 years has a lot in it. There are historians who question whether this is the best way to, to tell. There are 
people who question, the, who brought in question of power. Um, there are also historians who said, look at my mother, look at me. How come my story or my mom's story is not told? Are they not, is it because they're not important enough or they are not representative? No, it's not about that. It's about power. It's about who has the right to speak and the consequences of people whose voice were never heard, whose activities were never told, suffer. And so there, 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 there are lots of people coming into this like century old discussion to raise questions. And so gradually, uh, there are also people from cultural studies, for example, who felt that um, sociology is not enough, anthropology is not enough, economics is not enough, because there are things these disciplines don't talk about, or even the discipline of history. It seems to move away a lot of things that uh, result in our loss of our, our identity or the significance of, of our living. Or the point of view is never from the I, but it's from the they and the we, right? So I think cultural studies have a long history of fighting to think about agency and how human agency individual could be represented. Uh, how to represent is still uh, an, an open question. And then I think artists also came in, in somewhere in the 20th century, thinking that uh, we are so much dealing with concrete objects, just like the archeologists <laughs> picking up a piece of stone and dead people's uh, food or furniture that we are no longer used. We are dealing with very concrete objects. These are you know, what artists actually really, really do. It seems there is something we can do. It seems the activity of collecting doesn't need to be about the museum and the, and the National Archive. It could be us. And also, people would, would question a sociologist if he or she wants to, um, want to say that the personal and the I must be given a stronger representation. But if artists say that, no one will question us <laughs> because it seems we have the license to speak of the personal. The I in the world of art is very honored for some reason. Of course, I'm not saying that we are, we are very, very okay, but I'm also saying that this I is often being questioned, being delimited, and yet we're still allowed to highlight the I and by other disciplines. So I think many of these things come in and, and of course there are actual crises, social national crises, mm -hmm. when we felt that there are no other ways because it's not about changing the government or changing the world. It's about speaking. <laughs> it's about preserving memory. So I think I'm, I don't want to make this discussion very simplistic mm -hmm. because it's really, you need to measure how at one point, for example, in the 19th century, archiving and the reflection on how to tell the story of one's country and one's society became a very important thing. But that point was very much about, especially in Europe, it's about unification. There were several unifications across Europe. So now we have Germany and Hungary and France, but it was not that simple in the past. They were always part of one another, and Italy, for example. And I think, uh, and in a discussion like this, I, I tend less to, to ask what about Chinese and that sort of question, because we are actually part of this global, global uh, environment and we are being, because of trade and economic activities, we are always in the process of exchanging, exchanging ideas and also learning from, from the West. And China at one point, thought of it as a major, major project to learn something good from the West. So I'm not defending the West or to talk against China. No, not at all. I'm just saying that just as a historian looking at the past 150 years, I think many things have prepared us. So the fact that we can do projects like this, we have to thank a lot of people. So then I need to throw back this question to, to the two of you. 
how how do you think uh, your experience of doing this project um, enlighten you uh, about what to do or what's the role of an artist in in getting to shape history because you are shaping history for sure um, if you just talk to the six of us here and the people online and then tomorrow morning we forget about everything then it has no impact but we assume that your work will be shown with travel you talk have conversations with your work so the impact is not something that uh, that i take for granted that there is but because that actually would happen so let me throw back the ball to the two of you <laughs> <laughs> I think maybe Jiwai can take up this yeah, question yeah. more. Oh. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so the First. question is about the role of an artist. It's exactly the question you asked me. I think you should <laughs> answer the question. <laughs> um, I don't know because I feel like I'm still very juvenile in how or very young mm. or i don't know i haven't done haven't done a lot with this um topic but but from this project that i've done and the the one i did last year which was about lai yun amusement park and mm. the nita Mui and hong kong collective memory and collect and history i kind of feel like a lot of our my own historical account is based on what I've heard and mm. from it's existed long before I was born mm. but then somehow I feel I don't know if feel is the right word but have this memory from what I've heard from my parents or just from the media here and it has become part of me so I'm very interested in looking to the mm. past that I've never experienced before. So now you have done this several times already. Yeah. <laughs> do you think you would ask different questions? I think I do think so. I feel like this has already been um, a step from my previous project, which was about something disappearing. And I feel like there's a lot of emotions based on something that has been demolished, something that's not there anymore. Whereas this one is kind of talking about absence itself. Mm. And I feel like absence and disappearance are kind of, it's similar, but different in the sense that absence, it's something that's not there. But then I learned that to when there's absence, there's presence. And through presence, it kind of lines the walls that contain what's not there anymore. So, so let me play the devil a little bit. <laughs> what if we don't know about Wall City? What, what are we losing? What if we have no idea exactly what happened to Andy Tumoy and, and, and uh, Lai Yun or Entertainment Park related to her? What if we just, we just don't know? We have no idea. It seems something is at stake. Mm. Right. So, yes. what what is that to you? I think it's to do with um, our identity as mm -hmm. a someone from Hong Kong, um, because this these these collective memories are kind of built. They kind of form our identity, and I feel like if we don't know about it, we don't know where we're from, mm -hmm. or uh, yeah. It, yeah. What if we don't know where we are from? We just become a global citizen. <laughs> I'm, I'm playing the game. <laughs> I don't. There's a, something that's quite sad about that prospect mm. of not knowing where you're from. Mm. I, I am still. I don't know how to answer that question. Can I ask? Because I'm always curious about Gy's like strong passion about the past, like. Do you think it's because you always feel some distance between you and uh, what's supposed to be? Can I ask? Yeah, yeah sure. Or what, is there other reason? I, um, I think partly because when I went to university, so 
I was born and raised here, but then I left home at, in 2015. And then in that time, in those five years, I feel very disconnected from my home. Mm. And even when I was younger, because I was educated in um, international school, so I feel very, very disconnected to who, who mm. I am as a Hong Kong person. Um, I think that's part of why I want to know more and to mm. be more close to my home. But also, what I always feel like when I was um, a child, I already <laughs> would look to the past. <laughs> I'm always kind of sad that, oh, my youth is over or something. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> so I'm, I'm throwing a very difficult question that I don't have an answer myself. I, but I think I ask it because we spend so much energy into creating these pieces. Mm. There's got to be an, an objective or at least uh, perhaps on the existential level. We just need to be recognized as having present. Mm. <laughs> or the, those, those big questions about, about memory, it's just like history to me. There is only memory when you try to recall. <laughs> it's, it's always the product of an activity. And so this is how, why I think the, the motive to the act of remembering and the motive to create, trying to make accounts of the past is, is important. And it, maybe it cannot be, I do not want it to be boiled down to one ultimate <laughs> absolute reason, because I, I just can't say that, well, it's my country, therefore I need to. But I, th I think this kind of uh, answer can, cannot take us very long. Not, not a long way down the road, but, but working as an artist, things are maybe more existential. I don't know. Like Wanky, you are constantly looking at uh, um, what it means to, to be a Hong Kong person and how to remember. So there's a lot of decision and there's also a lot of danger too, because we are not, not encouraged <laughs> to to, to remember so many things uh, in a way that we would affirm a Hong Kong identity. And then the big question of what is a Hong Kong identity? You know, is, there, is, is it one thing or something we can really summarize in five points? Something like that. And not, not only to, to ask that question about Hong, Hong Kong. I think we often ask those identity questions because we feel we are in crisis. We feel we're about to disappear. Mm -hmm. But isn't this also true because we often assume China is one thing. China is also not one thing. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I guess through the process is uh, uh, because of this sharing and recently there mm -hmm. is a theater piece that is also dealing with uh, similar topics. And I've been thinking um, it's about, uh, actually it's not just about the past because I think, especially from the Swimming Pool project, I found that there is actually, for example, the neglected proposal. It's a document, it's, it looks like it's very mundane or it's uh, <laughs> yeah, not, not sexy, but, but at the same time, it, it shows there are other possibility that we might have, uh, chosen mm -hmm. and and that we might be okay to choose it today or in future so so i think it is kind of uh give some idea or inspiration for for the mm -hmm. for the future as well and mm -hmm. also as an yeah it's not like a fact but more towards the imagination because because when we start, I like, feel like this atmosphere in Hong Kong, like we try to preserve what had happened or things like that. We try to capture what really happened. Mm. But sometimes we neglect what we have thought about or we, uh, we wish to happen. And so I think if we could open up more on this uh, 
expect will be maybe there is no answer, but we just keep writing. Mm. Yeah. I, I guess you brought up two points that are very meaningful uh, to me. First of all, is um, let's not talk about the falsehood and, and the truthfulness of remembering and, and history writing. We, we want to think more about the use of history and the use of memory. Uh, we, we don't even need to repeat this common sense idea that our memory is always selective, right? Of course, let's not waste time to even <laughs> debate this, but our memory is selective because we only remember certain things because we are compelled to remember. So it's, it's always about use, use of history and use, use of memory. The other is um, maybe as artists, I hope we all can share this, this sentiment that artists should be the first who speak up if people want to uh, narrow down reality into just political activities, into just uh, government uh, natural meetings <laughs> or executive uh, uh, policy making. I think artists should be the first people to, to reject that. Let's not, please, please don't, don't compress reality our existence, which is so rich and so full of complexity, into a very flat layer. So then there are things that are actually very, very much um, at the back of our mind and it affects how we act, how we make decisions, such as negative feelings, such as a sense of uh, insecurity, uh, fear. And, but we often, often feel that these things are, are should not be talked about or they should be thrown out of uh, an account, which is about the past. I mean, this, this is why I, I, very, mu I very much like the, the video that uh, um, Zy put, because when I look at those um, denture <laughs> manufacturing, I, I really could see that there is so much texture of everyday life that we have ignored. And these things really cannot be boiled down to one or two conclusions. Mm -hmm. And also fear, uh, not being able to, these are also lived realities. And, and why, why can't we represent incapabilities, <laughs> um, absence and fear and the sense of inadequacy and, and, and all of that, I guess, really uh, artists have more resources <laughs> to and more legitimacy to 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 deal with this i i guess you are doing the right thing these works must be talked about and shared you can't just make it and just put it in the gallery and then <laughs> Thanks, question we have some questions <laughs> Can you read it? Assuming archiving is to preserve events the way it is, how do we help filter our author documentation? And what metrics can we rely on to measure whether an event is true to reality? If we never knew about Anita Mui and Kalimau City, we might not have a fabric of memories to bond our Hong Kong diaspora that's growing. Good. That fabric might be crucial for our ancestors. Thank you. I, I like the second comment because it, exactly this is why I asked you guys, you have to tell me. Because <laughs> I, for me, why do I have to remember Anita Mui? Of course, I want to remember her because she at least stands for many things, stands for a certain layer of of lower class living before you were born, when I was already there. Uh, how Lai Yun was a very unique place for children when I was a kid. That it was, it all has to do with uh, whether you can afford to go to Lai Yun. You don't go to Lai Yun all the time because it's expensive for an ordinary citizen. But then, but then the Anita Moi story also touched upon a very, very complex web work of cultural industry, of how stars are being created, um, how the popular songs that 
we we learn from her is not just you know very much touching us, but it is also a whole system, whole startup system of star manufacturing uh, with a lot of you know it's it's about human labor, it's about eco cultural labor. Uh, so I I would definitely want to remember Lai Yun and also uh, and Little Moon, but of course there are also personal usage, right? Some of us simply would just want to remember her because there are people who just live a whole life not being able to get the love they want. And we, we are not supposed to say that, oh, just love is not economics. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it is not financial crisis, it's less important. Artists should not say that. And also people in the humanities should not, should not think that, that way. About the first question, the first part I don't quite understand because I think uh, when we talk about archiving, we are talking about collecting without exactly knowing uh, what the function of the object is going to be. We collect because we fell within range. There are certain things we want to um, at least save for now so that later on we'll come in. So I think the usage of a uh, uh, an archive is very different from going to watch a documentary. The documentary is already digested. The documentarian digested the event through narrative methods and editing and etc. Um, some conclusions are presented to us in order to persuade us to subscribe to the conclusion. But archiving does not do that. And if it does, then it's not archiving. <laughs> So uh, I don't know whether I can uh, use my own work as an example. I never go out to shoot, uh, call a crew to go out and shoot and make a work. And I'm not saying that I'm better. I, I'm not worse anyway, uh, but it's my method because I started with just doing everyday video diaries. And then over time, I realized, oh, wow, I have so much. If I don't start to look into it, then I'm going to just create an archive and for people to use it when I die. <laughs> okay, so, uh, so at one point I turned myself from uh, being an archiving person into a, a user of my own archive. And all the works I, I made so far are all going back to my own archive to look at what there is that I was not aware of. And so this gives me a chance for two kinds of things. First of all, it challenges my ability in narrative construction and interpretation. The other is um, actually because I always look at my footage many years later, I'm, I am encountering a past eye <laughs> with the present eye. And that experience excited me. Uh, I guess uh, coming down to a very basic level, what, what is history? It can be very grand, but, but history is important because we want to have evidence that we have lived and that we are dynamic, that we are not static, we are, we are growing. So it so happened that I cut out this kind of work for myself. So it also turns out that every work, I have footage from at least 10 years, <laughs> was often more than 10, 10 years. And people look at it as that, why don't you, you know, upgrade your imaging, make it sharper, you know, more high res? I said, no, because the images were also documents of the media, the cameras that I'm using. So I'm not going to improve the quality, make them sharper because <laughs> You, I, I, I shoot this thing with different camera, it will look different. That is the history of media. <laughs> so, so there are many issues we can talk about from, from here. Uh, uh, I, I guess I do not want to take up the role of interpreting, interpreting your work for you, but more to push you into finding more the meaningfulness of what you have done. I think, I think my, my sense is that both of you have done something very much out of your intuition and you have good skill too. 
you have good media skill to, to, to push it through. Now it's time to ask yourself, what have you done? <laughs> what have you actually done? <laughs> Do we have more questions? Or maybe the audience in front of us can also throw some questions. <laughs> Uh, so the work. Maybe you want to a bit louder. Yes. You let the online people. Yeah, the microphone. Uh, oh, when when I when I looked the the eyes work, I can feel the time. Mm. Uh, so I I also want to push <laughs> <laughs> to talk about this. During your experience, making making filming the work. Yes. So I think, um, is it you feel the time because of the still shots of in my film, or more so in what aspect? I'm I'm curious. <laughs> Through your work, I, I feel everything is 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 temporary, mm. temporary, and everything keep changing, and uh, actually we can't stop them. Mm. So it reminds me, uh, it's 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 more like the. I think I understand what you mean. Uh, it, it relieved me. Mm. Everything is temporary. The the idea will relieve me when I when I uh, in my life. Mm. So it's it's the is your work give me the, the feeling? Thank you. Yes. Um, I think it's um, also when I filmed this work, I didn't I didn't intend to um, incorporate all these shadows, mm. but because I went there on a very sunny day. Evidence of the sun. I I actually visited the park quite frequently throughout the past few months. Um, but then when I filmed, I filmed it throughout different days, but then the one day that I went, it was very sunny. And I think it casted some shadows which kept appearing and disappearing. Mm. And that's why I wanted to capture this aspect. And I think maybe that's where the temporary, temp temporariness comes mm -hmm. from um, because after the, the bright four o'clock sun or was it I can't remember what time it the shadows are gone mm. and so there's a, a kind of impermanence to those shots I think um, yeah I don't know <laughs> I, I think the, the this is a very interesting comment it it seems to point to the fact that we're making artwork because we are responding to, mm -hmm. to the world around us. If, if we turn everything into a discussion of history, mm -hmm. what is history? It, it, we will be betraying the work. But is history not there? Of course, history is there. So I think there's, there are many entry points for, for an artist. Wants to start thinking about something that is has disappeared, or wondering what that history was actually about. That moment excited you, and you started to do a lot of things. So, I I I, I agree with uh, Yuan Yuan that if we look at your work and just thought about the question of history, <laughs> you should be very disappointed. <laughs> but but we actually look at your work because your work shows an attitude that you have um, brought to the work. The flair is not exactly an answer to 
the normal, the normative question of what is history and what is memory, but it's about what happened to us, what happened to our emotions once we start to make an, uh, an attempt to deal with something in the past. Mm -hmm. can, can we think about it this way? Uh, I think we can. From that perspective, your, your incentive was uh, focusing on something that was quite disappeared mm -hmm. in past perfect tense, right? It was, I think, 1993 when it was the last time this, this, this was uh, disappeared. Mm -hmm. Now we can use these verbs in passive voice. <laughs> uh, so there is uh, a long duration, 20 something years uh, in between. But I think uh, uh, Wanky is very different. You're de dealing with two years. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So your time frame is totally different. And, and I'm quite sure different people taking up these two years as a time frame would come up with a, with a very different work. Or maybe, I don't know, maybe your, your work, which seems to be crossing 20 years, 30 years, and Nitamu is was 40 years old when she died. It seems you're crossing quite a few decades, but maybe the the moment you felt making it was actually rather present. So this is, again, the question of um, the use of history or trying to find our connection with the past, trying to build a relationship with the past by, by bringing in your person, your personality, your, the ambience of the work is more important because we are really art makers. <laughs> We are not just historians, right? If, I'm a, if you were a historian, I think you have a lot of material you did not share with us. They are more the historical document that would lead to um, a fuller account of what happened in the past. But you are doing it and you are not doing it. And I think that's a good thing that you are not exactly <laughs> trying to build a history. Yeah. It's very fragmented, like I think when before we talked about mm -hmm. um, why our kind of all historical accounts are subjective through our own lens and through our own memory and experience. I don't want to say that because if you say that you're undermining, undermining your work. Oh. It's not it's just it's not fictional or fragmented because look, the danger was really there. <laughs> there are still people doing it. These tools are real. The process is real. It's just that you, 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 as an artist, you don't have the obligation to uh, turn all of these fragments into a, a logical account mm -hmm. with clear uh, beginning, middle, and end, or a, a clear remote, uh, remote causes and uh, immediate causes and 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 consequence. You're just not doing this, but. We have moved away from that, even in history writing itself, mm -hmm. right? So sometimes I worry when the word fragment is being used too much <laughs> because fragment can, can, can be very negative. But I think if we talk about fragment, we should talk about what we are doing with fragments because mm -hmm. we are actually very innovative and very productive with, with fragments. And without the fragments, there's no second level his uh, memory, which is the discourse level, the narrative mm -hmm. level, would not happen if the fragments are not strong. So, and again, the, for the archive, fragments are enough mm -hmm. because fragments are fragments are waiting for interpreters mm -hmm. in future. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We are a bit overrun already. Ah, sorry. Do you have no, no, no? We, do we, any of you have question? On if Zoom? No. <laughs> then then we classmates. thank you. No. Uh, some maybe. And <laughs> if no, then thank you for joining us. And there are still the show will last you coming Tuesday. Tuesday. So to witness TY's full picture and, and Wanky's full video, <laughs> then you can come to the SCM. Yeah. Thank you Thank very much you. for coming.
see you. Thank you. Bye bye. Oh. Hey, Seth. Thanks yeah, thank you. And thank you, Linda. Yay. Who's that? <laughs> hey. hey. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. 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 Bye b